Today, we're excited to present Dr. Juan Francisco Salazar, a Chilean interdisciplinary researcher, author, and documentary filmmaker. Dr. Salazar is a professor of communication and media at Western Sydney University, where his work explores the dynamics of social ecological change through collaborative ethos across arts, sciences, and ac activism. In this session, we'll preview Dr. Salazar's latest film, Cosmographies, wrapping up with a Q&A segment. Q Cosmographies is a 93-minute hybrid film that blends speculative fiction, documentary, and indigenous futurisms to tell cosmic stories about the struggle for environmental justice in the Atacama Desert. The film serves as an allegory against the colonization of the Moon and Mars, featuring Maori astrobiologist Sue Noon in 2051. The film is a collaboration with performance artist Victoria Hunt and the Likananti community of Tokanao, Chile, and is part of the ARC Future Fellowship Grant. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Salza. Hello, everyone. You are the brave ones to turn up to the film screening. Thank you for coming. And thank you to Hema Boddington and uh, Badra Chandran and Anthony uh, Kutaya for this invitation to share this work. I just wanted to frame uh, the, the film uh, differently. This is the second of only two screenings in Sydney this year. Uh, the first one was last week at the Hoyt Cinema. Uh, we had 90 people coming, mostly film industry and family. Uh, Julie was there. Um, thank you for repeating uh, the film. Uh, but today I wanted to introduce the film in a different way uh, as part of the um, ARC Future Fellowship. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I did in four years of the Future Fellowship that just ended a month ago. Uh, that was the title of the project, Social Imaginaries of Outer Space. And the first part was a report to industry uh, where we interviewed with uh, Colombian sociologist Paola Castaño, uh, 40 key stakeholders from the uh, Australian space industry. Uh, and we created this uh, report uh, about framing the futures, how the key stakeholders from science and technology, from law, from defense, uh, from arts, from law, are imagining the future of Australia as a spacefaring nation. The project also had two wonderful PhD students, uh, Kerwin Davi, who finished about a year ago, and her work was published now by uh, Penguin Random House, her collection of short stories, Only the Astronauts, which is a beautiful book of short stories that follows her work, Only the Animals, from about a decade ago. And the second PhD student, DCA student, is Robert Nugent at the ICS, uh, who is finishing uh, a beautiful film uh, called Signatures of Earth, as part of her, his DCA uh, on a cinema of planetary regard. The third element of this project was a series of public symposia uh, with the Powerhouse Museum in 2022-2023 with national and international guests uh, exploring the idea of space imaginaries. And we also did one in Paris uh, with Leonardo Olatz. The fourth output of the project was a quite a massive uh, handbook of social studies about space, which was published about a year ago uh, with archaeologist Alice Gorman. It was a 600-page uh, and 50 contributors from around 30 countries. And Cosmographies is the last output and the real reason to make uh, a future fellowship grant. That was the, the whole idea of doing the, the, the fellowship was to be able to make another film. And it's a sequel to a film that I did 10 years ago in the Antarctic called Night from Gaia that I know some of you have watched. So the film has been cooking uh, for about 10 years. Uh, it was shot in the Atacama Desert where I started working in 1992. I've been working there for 30 years, so it's a big circle of 30 years for me. I did my undergraduate thesis there. I did my, you know, work. I lived there for many years in the 90s. I have collaborated with Lincoln and Thai communities on and off for 30 years. So I'm really honored to, uh, for the film to be a platform for some of these stories. There's going to be a QA and a at the end and more information on the website of the film, the Instagram, if you want to watch that. 
So thank you again for coming. I hope you find the film interesting. Uh, technically three years. It started in May 2021 uh, during COVID. Um, it began with a trip to Central Australia, South Australia, with um, a colleague, Lisa Stefanov. Um, meeting people, knowing country, listening to stories, but then the film moved to Chile for reasons that I felt I, I didn't have the, feel the responsibility to tell the stories in Central Australia, South Australia. I had a dream, um, uh, a day that was very sick, and a battery in Victoria appeared and hadn't spoken to Victoria Hans, the then artist, Maori artist. She was saying, um, we need to do a, another another work together. And then we met and we decided to go back to Chile and I reconnected with uh, colleagues and communities uh, with which I had worked for decades. So the, the short answer is three years. The long answer is 10 years because it's a sequel to a film 10 years ago. Um, the longer answer is 30 years ago when um, the film is dedicated to the memory of Victoria Castro, who was uh, a mentor of mine in, in Chile, and she passed away during the filming. Um, I wanted to interview her. She was the person that supported my first film 30 years ago in exactly the same place. So I have footage that I took 30 years ago in the same, of the same volcanoes, the same community. And um, I said, it, I'll speak to her the next trip. I go back to Chile. And she passed away and I couldn't talk to her or show her the film. So the long story is 30 years. <laughs> When you are making the films, you never know if people are going to understand it, feel it, engage with it, or just fall asleep after five minutes or walk out of the room. So uh, it's really a humbling and uh, beautiful to, to hear when people reflect profoundly on things that we tried so hard to convey in the film. Um, because some of the stories are so um, deep in spatial terms and in temp temporal terms, uh, you know, stories that, you know, indigenous stories that are thousands of years old, spaces that are billions of kilometers away. I think it was a, a kind of narrative strategy to be going in and out and just showing glimpses, engaging with the glimpses that are powerful enough for people to imagine or to develop a connection, but not necessarily to explain, to go to the facts. Because scientists, you know, of, of all sorts, you know, natural, social, and everything in between, they're very good at producing the information and the facts. So why would you make a film to reproduce that? So we wanted to stay all, always at the level of just, uh, I think the film has a, a, a very tight internal logic, a very coherent logic that some of it transpires, some of it's not. So I can explain you what the time is doing and all of that. But it doesn't really matter. It's, it's how people engage with little bits and pieces of the film. And you can feel the vast of the universe, but also connect with very political stories, you know, of grabbing a contaminated water of the ocean and just feel the contamination you can almost smell the pet coat and then move away to you know another space time so uh, a lot of it is uh, hard work and long work um reading a lot of um indigenous futurism work uh notions about sleep streaming and space time and uh, connecting indigenous concepts with quantum theory uh, about you know multiple universe and space time so 
also trying to break that logic of you know, working against the canon of science fiction a little bit as well and, and breaking that canon and being a bit more speculative and, you know, magical realism or whatever you want to call it, but also working against that more, let's call it, patriarchal canon of science fiction where, you know, traveling through space time is... So the first technique for tra for her traveling was uh, similar to the first film through um, an AI... And Victoria this time refused and I said, no, I'm not going to use any technology. It has to be through a spirit. And that's where the Tanifa, which is a Maori spirit, uh, an earth protector comes in. That's the way that she tra travels through space time is more uh, a different device. So something like that. No, I, I, I fail at that tactic. She's even if I try, I couldn't do it. We had another question on our hand. Yep. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Isaac. Uh, all that work is documented. She's, she's um, Ali Kanantai, um, She's a very important Jimena. She was here, as you know. She was um, a, a visitor to the ICS for three months uh, last year. So she spent three months here in Australia. Uh, she's a, a very respected leader and an expert in, in Likanantai astronomy. Um, she has worked with ALMA in cultural astronomy. So all that work is documented. It's, it's properly documented. And, and she has documented Anthropologists has doc have documented it, so it's very well known work. Yeah. But I, I felt that it, it sometimes it's not necessary for her to tell those facts, but to engage with the person and, and how she's telling stories about the connection to the mountains and the parents. And a lot of the interviews were discussed with them. So there were long interviews, and we chose the sections together with every single person. It was a collective uh, discussion about which bits to use, not to use, why yes, why not. Sometimes I was pushy, sometimes I let go. Um, so th there's a big negotiation also that took place in how they want to be represented. The same with the landscape. So each community, there's 29 indigenous Likanantai communities in two parts of the, one is the Atacama Salt Lake, where the lithium mines are, where the government has opened up another 17 pristine salt lakes for lithium uh, exploration within indigenous territories, and another part. So these 29 um, communities have a different volcano or mountain as their ancestral tutelary hill. So all the editing has to was done respecting. So Jimena speaks with the Likenkabur volcano, Christian speaks with the Lascar volcano, and there's no mixing of landscapes. So the editor was, the first cut the editor did was like mixing this volcano with this person and said, nope. And so there was a lot of cultural protocols followed in the editing. So that people don't need to know, but it's part of the respect of the process. Um, so this is the second screening, uh, and the last one in Sydney until next year. And the third one is going to be in the community in two weeks, three, three weeks down in Tokonao community. So that's the test of fire. Not that this is not, but. Um, so well, I just wanted to check you didn't you didn't close the Zoom after the first um, your introduction. It's still running. Um, I haven't anything beautiful so the mic should be picking up everything yep. if you left it running that's great we are still recording we had a question in the fourth row um yes uh it, it's it's been a, a roller coaster film to make um it was done starting with COVID, you know, the worst 
uh, fires in Australian history, the Chilean social outburst, the defeat of the new constitution, uh, deaths of family members and friends, the war on Gaza, you know, so um, engaging in communities that are quite struggling on a daily basis for you know, I can't stop with shit. It's okay. Take your time. Just uh, be able to support, you know, um, <clears throat> big struggles and people putting their lives at risk. I don't know how to answer that. I'm a bit tired. It, um, it has changed me. Um, in many ways, I, I need to reflect. Let's change people, sure. Sorry. Very, very powerful film and no doubt huge part of your life. But another question? Elizabeth Herina, who is the shepherd that's, um, has never been interviewed, very shy. It comes from a very, very poor background. Uh, many of the others are being interviewed a lot here on news report, audio, many times, uh, like news to cab. Um, Reuters it, uh, was doing a, a documentary. He turned this documentary around the same time as I was filming, um, the, one of the last times. They interviewed some of the same people, Christian, a you know, well-known activist. The problem is uh, they come, they film, they extract, they show the film, and they never know what happened to that image. They never get it, send it back to them. They don't know how it was edited and with what message or intention the editing was cut. So part of the process is to work from not only the conception of the film, but all the way through the distribution, uh, all the way back. So the community of Tokanao, when they opened the territory to shoot in places where no one allowed to shoot the film mm-hmm. and some of the soldiers, they don't allow it anymore. They wanted uh, another documentary for them, which um, doing so it's just a, a documentary about their work of their environment of what they did and they wanted that as a kind of wish to uh work for free it's, you know we all can country to make film clubs and it worked quite well at the end and I, i'm hoping that the film can open up reflection but also dialogue uh, because those voices are rarely heard and when they are heard, they are not heard in their own terms. They are heard as kind of box box next to the, the manager of the mining company or whoever else. Uh, and that's what Four Corners does. And what Four Corners does really well. So I don't want to do follow up of all my that, you know, journalists so much better. And I don't want to have a neutral objective perspective of, okay, this is this voice, this is the other one. Uh, it's okay, you know, it's the perspective of a group of people that are more aligned, aligned with themselves, and you can check it or leave it. Uh, I, I didn't want to have, you know, all the perspectives from all the angles, because that's not the way I got to know the story. The distribution then will be through festivals, and that's quite tricky, because they are, you know, they have a sense of paranoia, so they all want world world premiere, all the festivals yeah. world premiere or international premiere or national or city premiere. So there's no festivals in Sydney or Melbourne or Adelaide until June of next year. So that means that if I show it publicly, that's why I was so thank you for your patience, the library for okay. you know, saying this cannot be a public because then a festival can say 
or you already did the public ex exhibition, so you it will you out. So I would send it to Sundance, to TPH Talks, to Rotterdam, some of the big ones, some of the small ones as well. Um, so every deadline of text box, we're going to send it. And um, the agreement is, is that there's a spreadsheet that the communities and everyone in the team has that they can check which festivals has been submitted, how much was the cost, and what the decision is. And then if select, if the team is selected, what do we do? Anyone can travel, but if it's in Pantiago or in Lima, I'm not there, I travel to the festival, so if it's not far away, it's probably not. But that's the way festivals first. Uh, after a year, when festivals usually don't take films that are older than one year, uh, uh, then it will be publicly available uh, on Vimeo for everyone to watch, as long as there's permission from everyone in the film to do that, to do that, and everyone has signed, you know, the permission. But I don't want to say, okay, so I have to hear all, all of your images. It will be one. Every process of execution that they will be on relationship lives on until no one really cares more about the film and and he's up here you would I don't know if my how to share it. I really appreciate your approach to ethics one. Um we had a question in the grey jumper and then we'll come to Some of you know that my part of my background was in alternative media, in experimental film. Uh, when I was uh, growing up in Chile, I read um, a short essay by Ursula Le Guin called The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction. And she, uh, in, in 10 pages, she criticizes thousands of years of the way that stories are told through a hero that needs to achieve something with a spear. Blood is spilled and the hero comes back home and tells the story and everyone is in awe. And that has a certain kind of minutes because it can be too long or too short. And that's how Hollywood works. That's how the media industry works with sausage factories. So probably a lot of the content that you watch is the same. Same five minutes grabs here with factual information very quickly. And she says that stories are not a spear to kill something or someone, but it's a carrier bag where you collect seeds and you put them in a bag and your story is not in the spear. Your story is in the container where you put different seeds or other stuff that you collect. So it's a much more different way of constructing stories. So when you're making a story, it's not about the length. This is the length that the film came out of, would have been 60, 70, 120, 45. So the film speaks through the footage. And so it's lingering in the space. It's being in the place. It's listening to the rocks. It's staying there. So it's not just information, move on. You've seen the mountains, okay. It's about creating an experience that goes more than a rational experience of understanding what's happening and just, you know, you can feel isolated. You can feel that you are so far removed. You can feel that you're inside people's hearts. You're, so it's not about necessarily what they're saying all the time, but traveling is creating a world that you can inhabit for 90 minutes. In this case, could have been 70, 80. I like long films. I like slow films because they create a different engagement. Even if you sleep, doze off, or find boring, but it's just a, a way of telling a story that I find uh, that for me it's easier to tell stories in that way. The music was uh, is very important, I and mean, in all of my films, sound and music are very important because it's. Sound works in very different ways. You know, it's not 
we humans are conditioned to sight much more than listening. So listening uh, goes through walls. You cannot see unless you have x-rays through walls. So sound is, creates a soundscape, a sound world that's very different and affects you emotionally very different than images. So I totally agree with you that a film with, with images and sound that don't work, the film doesn't work together, but the sound by itself wouldn't work without the images as well. The composer is uh, James Peter Brown. He's a well-known Sydney-based artist. He works a lot in theater, uh, in films, a lot in theater. Uh, and he had worked with Victoria Hunt for many projects before. And he had collected a lot of sounds, infrasounds from volcanoes. And um, when I told Victoria that I wanted to record, there's, there's a lot of sound that's not just music. The sound of the volcanoes, a real volcano. And now the sound of wind is real wind. The sound of the llamas, real llamas. So trying to create those sound worlds through, through the sound and just the music. But there's also a collaboration with Camilo Sansana, who is the geographer that speaks about the files of the beginning, and he's um, a geographer that works with the community, and he's a musician, so he plays the charango and the ronropo, so they did one of the tracks. And um, James also plays a little bit the charango and the ronropo, although not as well at uh, Camino, but there was also a collaboration in terms of, of the sound and and the epicness of the film, I agree with you, some, a lot of it is in the sound and uh, when I get emotional watching it, even if I watch it a thousand times, sometimes it's the music that is really, you know, hitting me every time I watch it. So that's a short answer to, to a complicated question. Thank you. Uh, just just to say quickly, at the other screening, a man approached me. He works as, uh, in a, in the airport, Sydney airport, in a kind of logistical um, role. And he said, I want to congratulate you because a year ago I saw uh, the same topic in Four Corners and I thought it was so boring. He's a very politically engaged, you know, worker at the airport. And through your film, I was able to really understand emotionally and intellectually what is at stake in that place, that all the information I was given by Four Corners didn't move me at all. And now I really want to know more. So that's an interesting um, response that I really liked from someone that is, like you said, not from the genre. Um, and I think it was, it was like this. I, I completely agree. Yes. Lots. The appearance of the lava, yes. Thank you, Hart. Uh, for, I'm sure that you all know, but if you don't know, Hart is my mentor. I came to Australia 26 years ago because of Hart Cohen. I found him on the internet. And um, so I just wanted to thank you, Hart, for our friendship of 26 years. And I'm really glad that you're here uh, today. It means a lot to me. Um, the question of length, again, um, I, I confess I like long films uh, and long work, but if you frame it from a, a decolonization perspective, uh, decolonization is not only about space and territory, also about time. And we are very colonized in terms of how we consume media around the formats. Half an hour of television, one hour of television, now one hour series or films that need to go for a certain amount of time. So rebelling against genre of factual and fictional also there is a, a part about trying to work outside of the constraints of time uh, and even if it feels longer than it should be uh, I feel that it's something that I want to push all the time is, is that lingering in a space and time so the film has three endings. It hasn't, doesn't have one ending. Uh, and that's going against the narrative arc that has been shoveled since Aristotle forwards 
beginning, middle, and end with one climax. So men have one climax, women don't. So there's a lot of uh, women writers that have been writing about films with different climaxes and different endings, not just one. And I thought that was very interesting to explore in the film, how a film can have more than one ending simultaneously. Uh, uh, we had a big fight with the producer, Alejandra Canales, saying you can't have three endings. And I'm saying, you know, yes, we had, can have three endings. So that, that added to the length of the 93 minutes, the fact that there's a farewell from Atacama, there's a farewell from the astronaut in the future, and then there's a, like a spiritual farewell, so three kind of endings. And that moment of the Lama was, um, we were there with Doña Sonia, Mrs. Sonia Ramos. She's a very well-known defender of the Salt Lake. Um, she walked from 2,000 kilometers from the Salt Lake to Santiago um, with a white flag to talk to the then, then president to stop uh, the you know ongoing uh, mining. Um, she has had a lot of um, the, uh, you know journalists from France and you know the U.S. interviewing her, but she wanted to take us to places where the tourists don't go, which is the geysers, and she was one of the defenders of the geysers. And we were with Victoria and with Victoria's wife, who is a Metis artist from from your lands, art from uh, Montreal, Toronto. And she's a musician, and she played the, the Metis drum, and we did a kind of a offered, you know, a kind of ceremony of giving thanks for where we were and if we could film. And she asked us to do that ceremony of asking permission before we filmed and she said uh, it's okay to film now and we started filming the interview and that just happened in front of the camera by total accident and she said it's not an accident but she said she had never witnessed that in her life in her 50 years going to that place she had never ever seen a vicuña it's a vicuña not a llama in that space uh, and her emotional reaction is totally spontaneous and I was just filming so it was just a moment of I don't know Cin cinema verite cosmic connection however you want to call it but yeah it was just a, a magical moment and um, it happened it was the first I, I, I filmed five times I went five times to film there in two and a half years that was the first trip so it was always kept as a kind of ending, no matter what the film was going to be about. That was always going to be an ending or one of the endings. Such a powerful moment. Uh, the, the previous film in Antarctica had the same pace for the same reason, because life in the Antarctica was slow. Nothing really happens for hours. Uh, and in, in the desert, the desert is very silent. Uh, it's very quiet. People speak very softly all the time. And they repeat things many times. As a, it's, it's the mode of addressing you to make a point. So you make a point not just by saying it once, by saying it many times in different ways. So there were interesting discussions with the editor when she said, oh, they already said that. And I said, I know, but we cannot cut it because she's going to say the same thing in a slightly different way. And what's important is that reiteration is almost most important that what she's saying, almost. So there's a few parts where they say it two or three times exactly because of what you're saying. Fascinating, these aspects of culture that I wouldn't have gotten from the film if we hadn't yeah. this Q&A, is it's allowed you to go deeper and yes. reveal your practice behind it, what you've been through, and, and again, the cultural practices. Yep. So it was really fascinating. Um, if we could all, uh, on behalf of Ivory, I want to thank you. Thank you. Juan, thank you for this screening. It's It's been amazing and cool. Thank you. I really appreciate you, Kane.
Um, it's really important that you came and watched it. So thank you. Thank you, Emma and everyone in the library for organizing this. It's been beautiful and thank you for being so patient. And